Hi there, I'm Sheena and this is the Lesbian Review Podcast. This podcast is a spin-off of the popular review site thelesbianreview.com, where we review the best books, movies and music with leading lesbian, bi or queer women. The goal of this podcast is to bring you closer to the best queer media and give you access to interviews with people who are behind the scenes in creating it. I'm joined today by the fantastic author Vanda, who's talking about how she turned her book into a play. Vanda, thanks for joining me today. I'm glad to be here. Let's start with your book, Juliana, which is the first in your series, right? That's right. So tell us a little bit about it. Juliana starts off in 1941, and uh, I've often commented that, you know, well, she's not in it as much as um, the other character, the main character who's telling the story. There's a reason for that, and hopefully people will (laughs) will get it eventually. But... um, Anyway, uh, Al, the, the character who's coming from Long Island, um, comes, and at that time, Long Island was a bunch of potato fields, and she comes with her friends, and she's coming there to make it on the Broadway stage, and she runs into Juliana, and her life has changed. She has never ever thought of being with a woman or any of that, but everything changes with Juliana. So that's basically where it takes off, and the two of them really struggle because Juliana, although she's actively gay she is married and struggles with um, her religion about it so there's a lot of stuff that goes back and forth between the two uh to two women of that time so this is the 40s and the war world war ii so it's a very world war ii novel juliana is entertaining the troops uh, al is working at the stage door canteen so anybody who loves world war ii stories this is totally a world war ii story of people being very dedicated. There's um, both men and women in it who are totally devoted to the cause, but it also has the highlights what was happening to gays at that time, during that time period, what kind of things happened for them. So it's a history, history for everybody, and but it also has specifics about LGBT people. So you must have done a lot of research in creating this novel. Yeah, every little detail has to be researched. You can't assume... Uh, what's you have to be everything you say even you know the things that are normal to in normal speech now was not normal for them so you to, in order to not make it sound too contemporary you don't want it to sound foreign to people but you because they didn't speak our language obviously but there are certain phrases that we use now that would never be used in that time period to, I would often have to go through and say oh there's one of those phrases I got to cut that that's part of my editing process is getting rid of phrases that are contemporary that's interesting. Yeah, um, and hard, <laughs> hard to do. I actually can't even imagine. We chatted briefly once, and you told me about the the inspiration for this book. Oh right, I was walking down the street. It was a beautiful day. It was probably around April, probably maybe May, and I was on the opposite side of Washington Square Park. And on there are trees, and the um, buildings there are uh, some great novels have uh, have been pattern from some of those books and and uh, it's just beautiful things and I was walking across and getting ready to cross the street and there was a woman standing there coming the opposite direction crossing the street and I didn't really notice her but I noticed her necklace and as she came closer to me the necklace came in view and something about her tanned neck and from there Juliana came out and I can't explain it but that was the beginning of my character Juliana and I had to write that character. And you've written how many books in the series now? I've completed four and I'm in the middle of book five. But you have didn't just stop with like a whole series of books you've actually turned your book into a play. Um, well it's not it was never a play play. I, I was a playwright so my writing is always influenced by dialogue. When I was in eighth grade, and, and my eighth grade teacher first discovered that I could write. It was very encouraging. He used to, uh, you know, he helped me with a novel, my first novel that I wrote when I was in eighth grade. And he happened to say, you're really good with dialogue. He never said write a play, but he just said, you're really good with dialogue. So it was happening then. I don't, you know, I just dialogue has always come naturally to me. So when I wrote my novel, a lot of it's dialogue. See, I set up the scene, but then I have people talking to each other. And that's kind of what's natural to me. So there's so much dialogue, and changing it to a play was not really that hard. The hardest part is that the book is written in the main character's perspective. It's written from Alice Huffman, or Al, as she's called in the book, her perspective. And so there would be large uh, portions where she would be making comments about what was going on. 
And some of those comments are very important. It's not just narration, or, you know, like go from this part point A to point B, but her perspective on the world and, and how that changes. So some of that I had to make, preserve in the play, which was often difficult to figure out how much to preserve and how much to cut. You don't want to bore the audience with having a, an actor talk too long. But it was important to the play. We, we did this play over an 18-month period. We took the book and we showed various chapters of it once a month for 18 months. And we, these were actors who were not being paid. And you can't expect them to spend hours and hours on rehearsal. So basically, we would rehearse it like four hours in, before the show went on which was not a lot of rehearsal. So we were actually still using scripts, but they were so good at it. It wasn't noticed. Like you couldn't see them using the scripts. And it was just, and we had costumes and we had music. They sang the songs from the 40s and everything. We had a nice size audience that would come regularly. So it was never a play play. I'm just right now trying to do something with it and it's into a play. Because it's just never written in the structure of a play. Except that everything I write probably has a play structure in some kind of way. I think I learned to write a novel by writing a play, because everything you need for a novel is in a play. Okay, so let's take a step back. For listeners who don't know the story of how this all got started, so explain how you broke it down and where you were showing it. Somebody, when I was, I was uh, reading sections of it at a writer's group, and I belonged to a playwriting group. And I couldn't find a good novels writing group. A lot of people went to master's schools and they had all this intellectual stuff that they talked about. And I'm just not that kind of writer. So I couldn't find a group to belong to. So I asked my playwriting group if I could just pretend this is a play and uh, cast it with actors because it's the way we critique our work and, um, and bring it in. And they said yes. So I did that. And then they started saying, this is, this is a play. You could make this a play easily. And why don't you show it somewhere? And we couldn't figure out where that could be done with not too much expense. And then finally, we, we said, I, I, got, I contacted the people at the Stonewall, which was kind of cool. And we actually did the first two shows at the Stonewall Inn, which is, of course, famous for the Stonewall Riots. We couldn't stay there because they have a very loose way of operating and when you have actors, and we had, sometimes we have nine or ten actors, you can't change the date all of a sudden, or you want to bring in an audience, you can't change the date. So we ended up signing a contract with the, um, the duplex, which is just down the block from them. And the duplex has also been around since the 50s um, and has been a gay place, that, uh, gay bar, gay cabaret. And so we did that there for the rest of the, the run for the 18 months. We were at the, at the duplex, which was a great experience. How did you manage to get a whole bunch of actors to commit for a year and a half of once a month performances? You see, we didn't know we were going to do it that long. <laughs> we just <laughs> started. We just said, let's do this, you know. And the thing is that was explained to me by some of the actors, like one, the woman who played Juliana, I, I was always saying, I'm sorry, I'm not paying you. I can't pay you, you know, because I was paying for the space and that I could afford. And I was paying for costumes, but I didn't have leftover money to pay actors. She said, are you kidding me? She says, I... I'm now working every month. I have a job, even though in, in acting in New York, if you are working as an actor, it doesn't matter if you get paid or not. It's a job. Every month I can get people to come here and see me. I'm working all the time as an actor. She says, this is a thrill. She says, I'm fine. And that's what, kind of what was happening is that the actors were working. They were actually could tell their friends, their family, that yes, I have a regular gig and it worked for them. Yeah, you know, I would have loved to pay them, but it just wasn't possible. I didn't have that kind of money. That's pretty cool. And you say you're working now on trying to get like something more formal happening. So many of my reviews say this needs to be a movie. This could be a mini series, and um, I don't know the right people to make that happen. But it's true because it has. It's already written. <laughs> I just have to do some juggling. So I'm. Yeah, I'm gonna play with it maybe and um, see if I can submit some things, some parts of it around and see what I can do to make it happen because I would like to see it that way because I think see the one thing that's about this it's it is it's gay it uh, you know it's an LGBT it has both women and men the, the two women are the core characters but the men have a part to play and it's not just for gay folks it's about history it's about but it's I don't want when history people think oh this dry you know some dry classroom history no it's it's very alive. I have a lot of straight readers who read it, 
I have men, uh, male straight readers, women straight readers read it because it's interesting because they had no idea what was happening with gay folks. And so it's crossed over to some other populations. I, I scored high on Amazon in just history, plain history, not just LGBT history. So the history people, the history buffs are reading it. So it's, it's, I think it could be, you know, a, um, a series because it could hit a larger audience. I just have to know the right people or get something started or put it out somewhere. You sound like quite a go-getter. You hustle and, and make things happen. So I'm sure that's not a pipe dream. Well, I'm going to try. I'm going to try and see what, you know, what I have to do to get it happening. Yeah. Are you more interested in turning it into a play or like a mini series at this point? Like, what are you thinking? I think a play is too um, confining. The characters go all over New York. And, and you can do that in a play. You, you just do put it in the dialogue. And it's longer. A play is usually a restricted amount of time. You don't usually do years in a play. You usually do, you know, a, a couple months, a, a day. You know, you don't usually do years in a film or in a miniseries. You can go over time. I want to see the whole series done. Um, the characters, they age. You know, when the book starts, Al is 18 and innocent and learning all of this stuff. The book I'm working on now, she's 30, 32. So she's seeing the world in a different place and all kinds of new things are happening to her. And the, the world is changing because under the surface, and well, actually the world doesn't know it yet, but the gay folks do because there's just the beginning of people organizing for rights. It's just starting. And that's kind of an interesting place to be. And before, when they heard the word gay rights, even themselves, they would laugh. They say, oh yeah, right, right. What rights? You know, we don't have any rights. So that, but that's silly. But now they're taking it serious. No, we do have a right to keep our jobs, to have, to love. It's just starting to make sense to them. And so it's kind of an interesting place to be writing about. So they, I need to change, you know. Otherwise, you, you leave people in, in a very uncomfortable place. If you stop in the 40s, you know, <laughs> not, you know, not much has changed there. So, I mean, this could be a miniseries that continues over several seasons. Yes, yes. That's, uh, well, that's my dream is that I want to take the book into uh, more current times. I'd like to see my two main characters who go through the book. I'd like them to live old enough to see what happens because, you know, they don't have real um, high hopes for anything happening. Exci- you know, they don't expect what's, what's coming. Nobody did. And, you know, it was always, it was hopeless to be gay. I mean, you weren't going to be accepted. It was, you know, when I went to Fun Home, you know, the, the play Fun Home, and I sat in this bleacher-like things, and these very, very old women came hobbling down. You had to go down to get to your seat. And I thought, what these women have seen. And now they're getting to see a play on Broadway about being gay. How incredible. And I said, I got to take my characters right to, through to the, you know, right to into the modern times. I have to. They got to see this. <laughs> You're listening to the Lesbian Talk Show. The Lesbian Talk Show.com, your hub of podcast information. Was there anything that you felt particularly like you had to include in the book and you found a space just for that? Yes. I was unaware about the amount of Jim Crow and bias against blacks in New York City. I had no idea how bad it was. And when I started reading it, because you, when you get into gays, you, you start getting into all the minority groups and all the things that are going on. I was appalled, and I, I put little hints, because I, what I want to do with this bit is the white people don't notice it. It's not even that they're bad people, and they, you know, they're not necessarily even, they don't know that this is happening. They're just living their lives, and they don't know what's happening. And I want to kind of show that, like even in the main character, because sometimes the reviews say, well, you know, they didn't like what this character did but you know that's the way it was they have to have like a whole awakening and that's not coming till much later and so even the main characters they see things that are off but they don't you know they don't get react in any way that we would today and this next book is going to be tough because i'm probably going to get killed but i'm going to use the language they used those days it was so much bias in the 50s just incredible bias for every group not, you know, we have, we have the blacks and we have gays and stuff, but there were bias for Italians, Irish, Polish, Jews, <laughs> everybody. I, I, I feel like to tell the time, the, the, about the time period, and it lets people talk the language they used. So I'm probably going to get knocked around. Because there's people that often just, they, they make a mistake of thinking, 
The way the character talks is the way the author thinks instead of that this is, you know, that this is separate. So I have to just do it. Mm. That's a that's a tough one to overcome, I think, as an author. I'll probably write an essay about it in the book. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, something to, to explain it. Yeah. Well, even and here's a simple thing that I'm going to have to explain is one of the characters is going is becoming butch. She's learning to become butch, right? She, and um, and I had to do some research. And I had to do personal research. This is not in the, on the internet. And how does she get the clothes? How does she get her first set of clothes? A woman can't buy men's clothes. She can't even wear men's clothes. It's a real complicated thing. I'm going to write a lecture about how complicated it would be for women to dress. But I found out that she would find somebody, you know, like she would get some clothes on, some men's clothes on, and she would go into a men's store and pose as a man, and those people in the 50s would accept that. Now, think of that. They didn't question that if she's dressed as a man, then she must be a man. Think of the kind of thinking that is. We would never do that now. No, not at all. Yeah, and I have to, because I have to write some kind of footnote or something, because people are going to go, oh, right, she walks into a store, and everybody lets her change into men's clothes and, and goes, you know, nobody questions it. They're not going to believe it, in the, but that's what happened. People were very wide open in there, and they really had almost a, I don't know what you call it, it's kind of a concrete way of looking at things. And I like to think of it as, instead of looking at them and us, I like to think of it as all of us growing together. As information has become more accessible and media has become more prevalent in society, our views and our experiences have grown. Exactly. I can experience what it's like to be a woman living in India today just by watching TV. Right, and you can empathize with something that probably you wouldn't empathize back in in the fifties. You know, yes. we can even like you know now uh, women, and this is not easy for everybody, but like especially in New York, where there or probably in where you live, where there's lots of different kinds of people, we we can now um, understand and and connect to people who wear clothes that are different than us. It's not a big deal. Some that's still an adjustment issue for some of us, but back in the fifties, forget it. <laughs> you know, everybody had to dress alike because that's how we knew. And there's a there's actually a biological reason for that, which I, I don't know if I'll get into in my book about. There is a reason that that people um, cling to their own. Um, it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a um, thing that comes from you know back in back in the day when we need to protect ourselves from uh, predators. But now mm. it's different. It's different. We and we have brains, and we can change, and we have adaptability, and we don't have to stay the same as our ancestors. They had different issues. And I think because we're so exposed to ideas and education and technology and other cultures and other people, we aren't stationary the way we used to be. So we're always evolving and changing. Look at the the difference now within the LGBT sector versus. 20 years ago. Oh, my God. Just the way they, they treat transgenders. Transgender people were treated abysmally in the LGBT community. It was horrible. And now it's very accepted. It was horrible in, in, in New York and in, in the United States. I don't know what it did in your, in your country, but in the United States, it was bad. And now it's getting better. It's not complete, but it's getting better. Okay, so is there anything else you'd like to talk about in terms of your book, your play, where you you going from here? Uh, where I'm going from here? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, right now I'm working, I, I'm always, you know, like people sometimes say, which one of your books are your favorite? It's always the one I'm working on. It has to be, <laughs> I can get through it. And I've just finished working at the school. I mean, I teach, I'm a professor at um, Met Metropolitan College in New York, and I've just finished up that. So now I'm going to be spending major time catching up on the book. And I'm really like into it because there's, there's a lot of new characters coming. Because Al now is going to be hitting the lesbian bars, which we haven't seen um, before. We've, we haven't seen the lesbian bars yet, but this is now, you know, that's where the movement started. And so she's going to be in the lesbian bars and, 
meeting lots of new people and, and lots of new changes and stuff. And it's kind of fun to be writing this and a lot to do. And a lot, this is major research. This is more research than I've ever had to do about everything. This morning I was looking up when did the first reel-to-reel tape player come out that was available to consumers. You could get music on it and you could tape yourself. That was a big deal. But I didn't know what year it came out, and so I have to get that. Oh, I have to get all those invention years right so that I know how they affect the people that are in the thing. I've got the hula hoop coming soon next year. I'm gonna, <laughs> in my next, you know, it's I'm in fifty seven. Fifty eight is when the hula hoop came out. Oh, that's interesting. I'm a storehouse of useless information, <laughs> and uh, the reel to reel that consumers could use was sixty four. It's actually so interesting because you don't think about something as simple as hula hoop or being able to record yourself. As right, being right. so, wow! Because we're literally talking to each other. We're on opposite sides of the world. Isn't that incredible? And <laughs> and yet, the stuff that we we had to adjust to, you know, like you know, all this stuff that used to be such a big deal. Like I remember, we were, we we recorded a TV. We recorded my grandmother who was in Florida on one of those reel to reel. So we'd have a tape recording of her voice. We talked on the phone, and it was so like. Oh, well, first, how much did the call cost? That was major because, you know, long distance was so expensive. And then it was like, um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I mean, is it really working? Is it working? <laughs> <laughs> and grandma screaming into <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so if people want to read your series, can they pick up any book in the series? Or do you recommend they start with book one and work their way through? Any, you can start with book one, two, or three. They are all; those are all standalones. But I would recommend starting with one because it's more fun to watch the characters change and grow as they get older and and learn more things. But it, you can understand the book, no problem. If you start with one, two, or three, four, it would be hard to understand it by that point. Okay, cool. And where can people find you online? Online, you can. Well, my my website is www. Vanda Writer, W R I T E R dot com. And are you on social media? Yeah, on Facebook. And I'm also, that's Facebook dot com slash Vanda Writer. Okay, cool. I'll add links to your online presence in the show notes. Oh, great. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. This has been a great time. And I admire what you do so much. This has been the Lesbian Review Podcast. You can find this and other awesome shows by searching for The Lesbian Talk Show anywhere you get your podcasts. We're even on Spotify now. Find more information on our guest in the show notes, as well as links to what we spoke about on this episode. And if you've enjoyed this podcast and want to see us creating more awesome content, then consider becoming a patron. Not only does this mean we can keep on doing this, but you will get exclusive podcasts that do not appear on the channel. You can find out all about it on patreon.com slash the lesbian talk show. The link is in the show notes. That's all for this episode. Bye.